What's up, y'all, and welcome to Durag Thoughts. My name is Trevor Went. I'm a visual artist raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I make art to challenge perspectives and give hope to the marginalized and oppressed. And Durag Thoughts is a space where we do just that. I talk about topics that challenge perspectives and give hope to the marginalized and oppressed. And we're going to keep rocking through the series of season two, which centers around my project, City of God. And today we're going to be talking about the track Wasted Way and really just talking about some concepts surrounding it and and just the different stories and, and what the kind of themes kind of lead into conversations surrounding. And so my guest today is a person who is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University, a graduate of Case Western Reserve University Medical School, is one of the smartest people I know, a uh, black belt in Taekwondo, um, and also someone that I'm blessed to call my my older sister, one of my four older sisters. And that guest is Krista Went. So thanks for doing this, Krista. Um, Yay, no problem. So so this this is a track that's really close to my heart because of just one, how how visceral and real it is, but also um, when you listen to the track and 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 view the video, you'll hear a voice at the end. And that voice is Krista's. And it, this was a moment that was was really authentic to kind of telling the story of what happened. And so just kind of quick backstory of what that track is about. Um, I moved back to Tennessee as that's kind of laid out in the beginning of the record and some of the tracks that we've talked about in the past. So I would planned to move out to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. That didn't work out. I got kicked out of Canada, ended up coming back to Tennessee and was really trying to figure out like where I belonged at that point. I'd been away at college for five years. My friends had moved away from Virginia Beach. I hadn't really spent much time in Virginia Beach. I'd wrestled throughout college. And so I was coming back to a place that at one time was home and it didn't really feel like home anymore because I couldn't go back to the campus. I couldn't do any of those things. And I just found in that time that my friendships were really empty. Um, some of the people that I was close to at the time kind of felt like they had forgotten me. Um, and some of my closest people, even my closest friend at the time, we we were really beefing just because of some some really differing opinions, opinions on some things and some some stuff that he really needed to work through. Um, and and I needed to work through in order to kind of have some healing within that space and some of the stuff that we had dealt with on the road and, and things like that. And so I really felt isolated and alone. I was living in a big house by myself and I had, I had gotten home from hanging out with a group of friends that I was close to at the time. And I really just felt like it was, it, it just kind of put a, a nail in the coffin of how empty that time felt for me. Um, and, and I called Krista up and I'm sure Krista remembers this conversation because it was hella dramatic. <laughs> and, and I was really, I was really um, kind of effed up. And, and what, um, you know, Krista told me in that that time was what you heard at the end of that that record. And that has been something that has stuck with me. And I just want to kind of talk about talk about that uh, even. Um, so, Krista, the advice you gave at the end of that that track was was really surrounding like um, having friends and in different pockets and, and how people don't, can't fill every pocket the same for, for you, um, or for, for anyone. So right. where, where did you get that, that thought from first off? So, um, that's kind of something that I had discussed with, uh, Dion, that's our older sister, or our oldest sister, um, you know, in growing up, um, just in the way, I don't know how much um, backstory everyone has about the way that we grew up, um, but uh, Dion is 16 years older than me, uh, 17 years older than Trevor, um, and so she really functioned as more of a parent than sibling, um, and I spent a lot of time with her, um, you know, growing up getting a lot of advice from her because, you know, she had a much different perspective on things than maybe um, 
mom, our mom had. And, um, you know, sometimes when you're a teenager, um, it's not so easy to talk to your mom. Um, so I talked to Dion a lot. Um, that's something that she had always taught me in, in terms of when you make friends, um, it's easy to kind of think of everyone as this friend that you're supposed to be spending all this time with and, you know, thinking of people um, as if they're, they're all the same. And that's really not true. Like everybody has different personalities um, between you and your friends. Not everybody you're going to be able to get along with at all. Not everybody's going to be your friend. That's first. And then even people that, you know, do like you are friends with you're not always going to be able to spend all of your time around them um sometimes you know people are going to be such that you know your personalities can only be meshed for a limited amount of time and then you know either you're getting on their nerves or they're getting on your nerves or they don't understand you to the point where you know you can spend all of your time with them. And I think that that is a lot more rare than people really think about. Um, it's not very common that you meet someone that you're so in sync with that you can spend, you know, unlimited amounts of time with them. And it's, I mean, it kind of seems mean when you think about it on the surface level to say, yeah, I can only spend an hour with this person or I can only spend, you know, one day a week or one day a month with this person other person but you know it's important to protect your own headspace um and make sure that you're getting what you need from your friends and also you're getting what they're capable of providing for, for you yeah that's real i i think about i that that advice was so helpful for me you know you know you know conversation you know me and you that that space was so helpful for me at that time because I, one, I, you know this about me, like I'm the type of person that one, I'm, I'm moody, I'm emotional. I'm like, and I'm really passionate about stuff, which I, I guess that's, that's what kind of fuels the passion. And so I don't, I don't tiptoe into stuff. Like, once I'm in it, I'm diving in. And so like wrestling, when I was in wrestling, it was like the focus, everything is I'm wrestling. I'm, I'm going to put everything I have in this. I'm going to cut this weight. I'm going to try to win a state championship. I'm going to put everything that I have, you know, into this, you know, my faith, Christianity is like, I'm going to, I'm going to try to win this youth convention thing. I'm going to, you know, show all this level of passion. Like I'm going to do everything that I can in order to be like to to be my best here and then and so when it comes into friendships it's a gift and a curse because you know i think even at times for me like i'd be like way too vulnerable off top which i think is also a kind of a byproduct of like you know white evangelical christian culture because it kind of tries to teach this idea that like you have to be you have to like be vulnerable with someone five minutes after you met them because you're, you are a Christian and Jesus has gave you, given you this unspeakable relationship where everyone can know your deepest, darkest secrets and stuff like that, which I, I really think is unhealthy. Um, you know, I, I don't think that everyone deserves, deserves every aspect of your vulnerability but i think that's a really unhealthy part of white evangelical christian culture um and these mega church cultures that kind of come up um but yeah i would like go head first like i'm in this i'm in this friendship here's all this stuff about me here's these hard like these hard hard parts of what i've walked through in my life and my childhood and this that and a third and then i'm like yeah let's do this and like People will be mad cool with you and grinding and still doing it. But then it's like when convenience shifted, when when you're not seeing everybody the same, like every day in the dining hall, when you're not 
you know, seeing everyone every day at practice or in the classroom. And it's like, oh, I actually have to like make an effort to keep up with this person. Even if they live down the street now, like I have to make an effort to keep up with this person. And you realize like everyone ain't built the same way. Right. And and everyone's not going to show the same levels of commitment and everyone is does not love you to that full extent. And so for me, I was really like coming ahead with that with a bunch of different friendships at the same time. And it it effed me up like it was really it was really something that that messed with me. And I remember that night you were you were telling me like, you know, maybe you can go to Johnson City, where there's more black people. And even though there's like three black people in that whole area, um, you know, but two of those black people live in Johnson City and only one lives in Bristol. Um, but you can go out there and maybe go and try to find some sort of function, some sort of art function, some sort of something like to just get some people that like you might see like once every two weeks or something that you might be functioning with, with for 30 minutes, but it kind of, it kind of helps to deal with this space where like your friends that you thought were like family aren't really like family, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's kind of interesting your perspective on it. Cause it kind of makes me think about again, kind of like going back to our childhood, just some of the things that you mentioned, um, or reminds me of like, you know, when you know, we had a lot of stuff going on that was like family business or whatever yeah. in childhood that was supposed to be like kept within the family and it was always don't tell the family business and you were always, you know, kind of letting the cat out the bag. Yeah. You have to kind of like keep an eye on you so that you weren't telling everything that, you know, we felt or mom felt like didn't need to be told. Except that one time. <laughs> Except that one time when you told the family business and I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> I remember it would be like we were supposed to like say I'm sorry I'm not allowed to tell family business. Like that was literally something that you know mom taught us to yeah. say to people. Like and I re actually remember you <laughs> You saying that to, um, I think you were in, you were in fourth grade and I was in fifth grade. Some, um, something like that. And, you know, we went to this Christian school where it was like very small. So like two grades were combined. So Trevor and I, even though we're a year apart and grade apart, we were in the same class. And I remember him saying to the teacher, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to tell family business. <laughs> I think that that's that one time. That yeah, you were talking about. exactly. Um, and I just felt like really put on the spot. So I was like, I don't even remember what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but yeah. And I mean, I think also, you know, it makes it a little bit hard because you did go to school in an area that was so undiverse, if that's a word. Yeah. Um, and, and coming you know, from Lancetown, coming from a yeah. super diverse school in VA. Yeah. Right. And then going to a place where, you know, literally the clan headquarters is like within driving distance, within yeah. easy driving distance. Yeah. Um, and then going to a school that was like a very small, you know, Christian college, you know, at the time it wasn't even where it had just become a university yeah. while you were there. Yep. Um, and I think that there's, you know, there's, Oftentimes, you know, in the way that we grew up, in an aspect of, you know, being like the token black person. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of times you can have a, a hard time identifying that you are really like a, a novelty to people. Like yeah. You're not really a person, you're a thing. It kind of reminds me of like when um, you went to Central Asia and mm -hmm. like some of the stories that you told of you know the people there having never seen a black person ever in their yeah. lives um the way that they interacted with you like you were not a human being you were you, you know kind of like not to say like i think this is putting it a little bit strong but it's kind of like you're you know 
like a, a carnival sideshow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not just, I don't want to imply that that's how, you know, some of the friends that you had um, in college thought about you, but I do think that there is some aspect of that, like how different you were from them. You know, it can be appealing on a surface level, but also it makes it more difficult for those people to relate to you and for you to relate to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's even like the, the space within that and the circumstances of like, especially when I started, because it, it, it started coming towards the end of college for me, which was really like my awakening in the space of how hard I go towards race and justice like right now um and i was i mean because trayvon was a pivotal moment for me um i had i was very aware that i was black and and what that was like and people like you know middle-aged white ladies pulling out of the aisle in walmart when they see me you know type stuff like i had plenty of racist incidents in my childhood and in high school and in senior year of high school and later in high school, I had plenty of those things. And I was very aware of those things. And I talked to my friends about those things, but when it came to like understanding systemic oppression, understanding like terms like white fragility and uh, terms like white flight and terms like um, just, just, just all these different terms that that are like commonplace in, in terms of understanding race, you know, in this day and age and, and currently, right? Um, white rage, stuff like that. Um, and so as college was ending, I was really ramping up in what I talked about, how I talked about it, like getting in massive arguments about um, stuff like stop and frisk and things like that. And I started like one of the one of the big pivotal moments for me was like I did a series that people who've been following me for a minute will know about, um, which was Freshness Fridays. And it was a weekly drop of experiences of racism that I had, like straight up. This is a story of my like of my life. And I had enough of these to go a year and a month and still had or a year, a year and a week and still had plenty more that I could tell, but stopped them for the sake of self-care, but also like to, to smack people with the reality that, yeah, I did this for a year and I still have plenty more left. And I'm still experiencing more as I'm doing this, this, this thing, right? And in that section of time, there were stories that I told, and I, and I, I told those stories anonymously I didn't have to, I didn't have to protect anybody who did any racist action towards me, who did, who, who perpetuated anything. I didn't have to protect any of that, but I chose to. But people who recognize their own names in that, I had people unfollowing me, I lost a mentor in that season, I had people coming at me, my DMs, people's peoples coming at me in comments and stuff, and there wasn't a ton of those, but there were definitely people who recognized their name and stuff and unfollowed me like, or, or recognize their story rather than their name. And so it was like, like there was, there was a, there was a really rude awakening point. Well, it was, I guess it wasn't really a rude awakening because I knew that was a, 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 a potential reality to, to, to potentially come up, but it was very much so a place for me where I was kind of coming face to face with the truth that, yo, you can't love me and, and, and disregard my blackness. And if, if that's going to be how this ish is going to rock, um, you don't really care about me. And, and if you're not willing, especially as a white person, cause obviously, like we just said, there were like three black people in the area, like the black folks that I, I knew at the school, we were athletes and stuff. There weren't many black people aside from athletes. And so, you know, for, for the white friends that I had throughout, you know, those spaces, it's like, if you're not willing to confront your racism, if you're not, if you're not willing to confront the issue that you're doing, that's problematic, 
you you are in solidarity and so and so especially like as i was in a space of life where i was calling more stuff out and 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 you know hitting harder it was it was definitely a space where it kind of exposed people and i'm not saying that like you know like like you had said before of the potential of like people treating me like a token um you know i think there there are definitely certain situations that that was probably true um but there there is a reality that i think a lot of times where it's like i don't care if it's church i don't care if it's work i don't care if it's your your freaking you know gaming group you know i don't care what the heck it is if people are like are going to take this this chunk of your blackness but not or or takes this chunk of your personhood where they don't have to recognize race where they don't have to recognize that like yo my experience is different than yours like there are things that i deal with on a daily basis that you ain't got to deal with um and they're not willing to take that stuff with it they they ain't really your peoples right. um but i mean i think it's it's hard because I mean, you and I have talked about this, you know, before. It's that people want to be comfortable. Most people want to be comfortable. And one thing about you, like as you've, you know, grown up and developed, is that you have this ideology of making people uncomfortable. Yeah. Making people confront the parts of them where they are in comfort and other people aren't comfortable and don't have that same luxury. But it's hard for other people to confront their own biases, especially when, you know, they're talking to somebody who has all these different experiences that they don't have. Um, and no one wants to be told that they're racist or that you know they have racist beliefs um or that you know the the ideologies that they have are rooted in racism and that's just the truth for you know a lot of different things um but when you demand that people confront that that makes them uncomfortable and you know people will start to pull back because of that um and I think that, you know, you were seeing in that season a lot of that, um, you know, again, being in Johnson City where, or being in Bristol, rather, where there's just not a lot of that. And although, you know, the people that you were around, probably a lot of them had good intentions. I mean, some of them probably didn't. Every, people are people. Yeah. Christians, you know, atheists you know, Muslims, whoever, people are all people and everybody there, there's good, there's bad, there's a different. Um, and it was like, there was a lot of strife. I feel like at that time, because of your interaction with, you know, being very involved in your church, being at a Christian college, but also being a black person in the South in a place that has a extremely racist history yeah um and trying to come to terms with that and i think that you know it was you coming to terms with like your own blackness um and what that really meant in ways that maybe you didn't do you know when you were younger um and then also you know trying to figure out how to interact in that same time when you know, whatever black friends that you had, they weren't there or you weren't that close to them. Like the yeah. reality is that all of your closest friends at that time were all white. And in that area. Right. The ones what I mean is like the ones that you really interacted with on a regular basis. Like all of your other friends from you know, when you were in high school, they were all spread all across the United States doing their own thing. You weren't seeing them very often. And even when you were home, 
you were at home for very long yeah. um, with being an athlete. So um, I think it's, it's definitely hard for people who have grown up in um, a very sheltered area where they did not interact with minorities um, for them to even have thought about the perspective that you you were trying to bring to the forefront um, and then I mean just the way that your personality is set up you're not a meek person I mean you know everybody in our family likes to argue and we're all pretty good at it yeah. So, you know, you're not going to back down from what you believe in. And most people, you know, they're not prepared for that. And it's easy to draw back from something like that. Um, especially when, like you said, you guys, at that point, you had graduated from college. You're not seeing them on, you know, a day-to-day basis unless you're seeking them out. Um, and, you know... People, people start pulling back from you and sometimes that's a hard thing um, the realization of you felt closer to people than they felt to you even, and they would give you like these empty platitudes like I remember you, you talking um, in that conversation about people saying oh Trevor you're like you're my best friend like mm-hmm. we love you blah 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 and you know you really trying to fight to get time in those people's lives yeah 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 that's real i mean because and and i i mean i have another direct thoughts episode about this specifically of like why i probably won't ever tell you that i love you is is the name of the episode um and i really talk about how uh i i've really come to a mindset that kind of came from something that I learned in college, but I was already kind of leaning in this, but I really, I really like this perspective. It's like, it was, it was coming from like Taoist thought where they don't use like ultimate words often at all. Like they're not gonna say, this is the best thing I've ever tasted because they assign meaning and worth to that statement because it's like well once you say that you can't say nothing else is because until it supersedes that but like you know in america in american culture we we so often are throwing out these terms without anything attached to them and so there's so much like oh i love you i love you i love you thrown out but there's not like what does that mean what commitment does that actually hold with it um you know there's a there's a poet I really like, a spoken word poet and a rapper, Propaganda, who has a track where he's talking about his wife and their relationship. And he says, love is not love if it's never been tested. And and I feel that because it's like, OK, so what do you mean when you tell me like you love me um, or I'm like family or I'm this, that and a third? Like what like what what does that actually hold like? hold to and and sometimes like like people will meet you one time and be like yo you like family um and i think that that's so bugged out (laughs) like i really do i think that's super bugged out um because you don't have any reason to stay committed to me you don't have any reason to hold me down any any reason to um you know, like when if if Ish hit the fan right now, would you actually stay? Like I don't know that about you, and the likelihood is no because you don't have that much stock in this thing. Like if this person started going through hell, like if this person started going through cancer or you know what a plethora of other things that they could go through, right? Are you still gonna be there? And you know, I'm I am not gonna say that like i am that i would be there for someone that i met last week right like oh yeah the person i met last week oh you 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 just like shot somebody and you want me to bail you out oh no god i don't know you is like but if like (laughs) but like if family like if something like whatever goes down with family i 
I'm there for y'all. Like, I'm going to be there for y'all through whatever it is. Because, like, we blood and that's how our family is. We close knit. Like, and we're going to and we're going to be there for one another, you know, regardless of what goes down. And I think that was I think that's. There was there was definitely like a re. There's there's just like a there's like a reevaluation that needed to happen, like, um, you know, Aaron, our older brother and I have talked in the past. We were, we were talking about something completely different. We were talking about like, which something this is also something that I've, I've heard Diddy talk about, about like, basically you can't hold people to the same standard of you. Like yeah. everyone's not you. And so like, right. so like, you know, in this example with Aaron, we were talking about like, we were talking about like work ethic and we were talking about like me, I can, I can go. It's like, I, I, I made this project. I got a master's degree and I was working full time at the time and I was still doing other projects on the side, like all these, th and then doing freelance here and there. So I'm doing all these projects at the same time. And I'm also like, as I'm, as I'm doing all these projects at the same time, I'm also grinding out, um, you know, just succeeding in all of them. Right. But not everybody can do that. Not everyone has that capacity. Not everybody has that energy. Not everybody is going to just go 10 toes down like that. And you can't, you can't expect and hold people to being exactly as you are. And so someone might say, I love you, but not have any sense of the same standards. And that doesn't mean that you don't, you know, flesh out what the heck that that ish means, but it's, but it's also like, yo, this, this, the way that this person sees you and the way that you see this person is, it might not be the same. Um, and I, and I think a lot of that just really comes, comes back to like, I don't know, taking a step back and, and really, I don't know. There's, there's a way of like, uh, I don't want to say like testing your friends or what, but I think there's, there's a sense of like, okay, like people do have to kind of like prove themselves to whomever, like, like love is an action. Love is love is a verb. Like you 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 have to do. You have to you have to choose to love. You have to choose to care for. You have to choose to um, continue to stand with someone. You have to choose to say, "Oh yeah, my bad. I effed up on that." Like I'm gonna I'm gonna get my stuff together and actually like do better in that capacity, right? Like that's that's love. But and so and so like people do have to kind of prove what the heck that they're talking about. Um, and and I think, you know, like you touched on, like Deanna brought out to you to really recognize that there are some folks who it's like, oh, yeah, I might. These these are the people like I hit up every day. These are the people that I hit up every week. These are the people I might talk to every couple of months. And so, you know knowing where people sit and and stand in different places of life i it's been one of the healthiest it's been one of, it's been one of the most important and healthiest aspects of stuff for me to to really come to that understanding of how i got a rock um because yeah like i said i've 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 just i'd be like 10 toes down um I'd be like 10 tones down and like super passionate at all these times. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily like translate to, um, to really having like the substantial kind of like relational needs that, that I needed. Um, last thing I'll say on, on my point in this is like, um, Lecrae was recently saying, you know, rapper Lecrae, for people who don't know, um, he was saying something about like dating friends, like, 
you know, how you, you need to date date friends like you would date uh, someone in a relationship and figure out like who these folks are. Um, and so, um, and, and it makes me think about how, how like, you know, companies like Bumble and stuff like that have like a friend's side to their dating apps. And, and there is a, there is a reality to that. And, and you realize like, as you get older, um, you realize that as you get older, that, um, it's harder, it's harder to make friends, it's harder to, to, to gain friendships and stuff like that. Uh, at least for me, I mean, I know, you know, you're in residency and stuff. And so there is an immediate group of people that you're consistently surrounded by. And so that, that might help in that, that regard. But I, I know for me, um, one, a big saving grace was going to seminary in some regards, because there were people that I had to be immediately surrounded by. Um, but even like some of my closest friends, like that I gained in Raleigh were from other sort other sen senses of initiative that I took. It wasn't because of people from work or whatever else like that. You know, my closest people in Raleigh were people that did not go to the church I worked at and, and things like that. I, for me, I felt like at least so far with the friends that I've really gained later in adulthood, um, especially because I switched my seminary from being like on campus, full-time student to part-time and only coming back in periodically. And, and so I kind of judged based upon like how people were keeping up with me, um, and how I was keeping up with them when it came to seminary, at least, um, when I was away. But I, I feel like the friendships that I've gained later in life that are closer feel like they have more longevity. Like they've got a way greater, um, they've got a way greater possibility to, to last longer. How did, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's something to be said for, friendships that are situation. Like if you put yourself in a situation where you are like in, let's say in college for you, your college was chosen not really because of the school itself. It was chosen because, you know, that's where you got a wrestling scholarship. Yeah. Um, and because of that, the people that you were meeting, really didn't have that much in common with them um and that i feel like when you're young you don't realize that that matters um that you are like-minded with people and you're picking people that you can kind of either you can grow with or once you're like kind of most people get to a point where they're kind of like set in their ways and their belief system is what it is and it's probably not going to change very much um and if you're in a situation where you're not around people that have those same similarities, then those friendships are necessarily going to be very surface level because when you get down to whatever is deep, what's deep for you and what's deep for them are not compatible or maybe even conflicting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that when you go out and you seek a friendship, you're and you're, you know, putting yourself in other situations where, you know, whatever kind of event you're going to or things that you're doing like outside of work or whatever, you're meeting more people where you have these similarities. And I mean, that's kind of like what I was talking about um, in that conversation when I was saying, like, you know, I was making these suggestions, like trying to figure out, you know, and, you know, at that point, I was like, I mean, super, super into the Taekwondo, um, such that, you know, it kind of consumed every aspect of anything that I ever did or talked about. And I was like, you know, well, maybe there's some sort of martial art you could be doing, you know, because, you know, you did, you aren't wrestling anymore because you're out of college, yeah. but, you know, still wanting to be an active person. I was like, I mean, am I 
my head was like, wrestling is a big part of who you are. Finding something similar where you can meet people who, you know, might have the same thoughts as you. Um, and, you know, we're kind of working with a very limited pool where we were living at the time. Um, but, yeah, I think it's just exposing yourself and putting yourself in a bunch of different situations where you can kind of meet people um, who, you know, are more compatible and, you know, with the hope of being that group of people or those couple of people who are going to be, you know, in that tight circle. Um, and, you know, kind of also being able to identify where people stay. Because I, I think related to something you said before, um, you know, about, you know, Lecrae and dating your friends, um, I think it's kind of, it's not fair to expect something from somebody that they're not capable of providing for you. Like, you expect people to be super close to you and to have this, you know, this extreme level of concern to you based off of, you know, some things that they had said, but they might not be capable of providing that at all. And they, or they might not be capable of giving that or being that for you in particular. Yeah. Um, and so you, you kind of, not only do you owe it to yourself to, you know, protect your own headspace. Um, but you owe it to those people to not demand things from them that they're incapable of giving you. Because yeah. End, it's only going to harm you. Like, I mean, yeah. I think, I think back to, you know, some conversations that we had about certain friends that you had and you would, you know, be telling them things that you needed from them, from them as friends. And, you know, Sometimes that's enough to get them to be able to to do that for you. But sometimes, you know, those people can't be that thing for you that you want them to be. Yeah. Being able to identify that is important because you need to move on. And if you, if that's something that you need, you got to find it from some other place or some other person. Yeah, that's real. Yeah, because... Everyone can't be everything. And, you know, especially if I, I mean, I think I think people have relational capacities, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily, you know, go with the ideology of like no new friends. Um, but there is a sense that, you know, if someone is like extremely, extremely close to, you know, a couple of people and they're married and they've got kids, they probably don't have the capacity to add on another really deep friendship where they need to like, like that's, that's high, high maintenance in a sense, right? Like a friendship where like someone needs to be, needs you to like chat with them like every three days or something like that, or every day, or every two or two days, or multiple times a day. Like, someone probably doesn't have the capacity to do all that. And so, you know, and it doesn't make them a bad friend, it doesn't make them, um, doesn't make them terrible or whatever else. It just means that, like, this person might not be what you need, and this person might not be as close to you as you think they are. And, and I think for me, there was, like at that stage of my maturity, it wasn't high enough to understand off top that like, yeah, just some people aren't, some people aren't those people. Some people are going to really suck at communicating from a distance and things like that. And um, you might have thought of them as your best friend and they're not, they're, your, they're not your best friend. You, you might have thought of them as family. You might have thought, thought of them as like your closest friends. And they're not, they're just not that. Um, and I think I really, I really got a perspective on that. And I, I don't think I've ever really thought about what you said about how 
I didn't pick college based off of anything, but like I, it's where I got a wrestling scholarship. So it's where I had to go. And so I didn't have a lot of similarities with people. And that, that I've never really thought about that. I mean, I, I thought about like how I don't necessarily feel like my college experience, like there, there are things I definitely gained from it and, and some good aspects of it for sure. Um, but I also, I think about like, what if I would have been, I went to an HBCU, which there's like one HBCU with the wrestling program and it's like D3. So there's not, there's not a lot of opportunity to be an HBCU, be at an HBCU and a wrestler or, or what if I would have went to a bigger university? I wanted to go to Virginia tech for a while. I've thought about things like that, but I, I don't know that I've necessarily thought about like, I was going into a space that wasn't necessarily equipped to hold me. Um, and I mean, I think about all the time about how, like, you think about people like Ryan Coogler um, and other people who are coming out of, like, film programs and stuff like that. You know, I, I watch a ton of tutorials and things like that on on film. And people talk about all the time about how these friends that they had in film school are, like, the people who are getting them jobs and, like, how um, there was, like, a film school where, like, you know, you know, like, multiple like major film directors were living on the same floor as one of one another like who are major film directors today and like i i can't remember who the two people were um but there were two like major directors or cinematographers who like lived across the street from each other growing up and they just you know you just you didn't know that that was what was going to happen but that's what ended up happening and i think about like how me as an artist, like there was a photo program at my school, but there, there, there's no one like me, like in the sense that the people that people I graduated with, the, the people I was surrounded by, um, and then even now, like where those people are sitting within what they're trying to do artistically they're they they are kind of more sitting in like the wedding and portrait photographer i'm gonna be a a you know creative for a church or reality or i'm gonna i'm gonna do those sort of things they're not like i'm trying to be an artist they're not like a cat who like went to pratt or went to scad or went to you know some other straight up art school and i'm trying to build like my artistic you know footprint in the world and i often feel like you know, I haven't necessarily been in environments that have really catered to artists. And so I don't have like this massive pool of like artistic friends. And, um, you know, in a sense, like the internet exists for some of those things and, and those purposes to gain those, those relationships and, and communal standpoints. But like, yeah, I just wasn't set up for that. And so there weren't a lot of black folks. And so those of us who were like, like like struggling over you know police murders of black peoples and things like that and systemic oppression all these things right like we're of a we're of a few and small like a, a few and far in between group right like we're a small knit of people and then on the other side of like that being a small group of people it's also a very small group of people that well, I, I don't I don't even know if I can think of anyone else from my college experience that like is looking at photo or video or whatever as like an artistic field to like go and be an artist, you know. And and then um you know like you get I like there were plenty of Christians, right? Um and I got some of those standpoints in, in seminary of like people who had more similar theology to me um, as I kind of developed in that and, and really kind of gained more of, of where I'm sitting now and, and the ways that I'm developing. But off top, it was just like, I don't know. I, I was, I, I just, I was in a really select group of people. Um, and that, I think that's a really, really good thought that you you get around like-minded people and like try to develop relationships and like-minded scenarios 
and people say that stuff all the time in so many different ways, like get in this club, do this, that, and the third. But like, I never have thought about that from a space of like, you're choosing your college and like some people have, are, are, you know, can choose them a little bit more freely than, than others. Um, but yeah, that to, to have like, like-minded individuals and stuff like that. Um, that's real. Yeah. Cause I think college is supposed to be, and for most people it ends up being like a very formative time in your life. Not only because, you know, you're at an age where you are really like coming into your own and becoming an adult. Um, but also, you know, this is the first for most people, the first time that you've ever chosen where do you want to go? Um, and you know, what you, what you particularly want to learn and why you want to learn it and where, you know, where you're going to get these experiences from. And I think that the idea is that people who are similar are making a similar choice for similar reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I think is why a lot of people have such strong friendships that last, you know, from, you know, college or, you know, graduate school or, you know, for me, medical school or, you know, whatever, um, advanced education, um, that you seek. But for you, I think that you still had that, those formative experiences of, you know, coming into your own beliefs as an adult, um, as a black male, uh, and as a Christian, but you didn't have the same experience of having those realizations happen and coincide with being around people that were like mine. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, you know, for people that don't have that, it's important to access your hobbies the things that you love and get around people that, you know, have those same interests. Um, it can, I mean, I think it's kind of like, you know, in the Bible where it says, you know, neglect not the gathering together. And I think that that's something that you apply not only to going to church, but it's the idea of getting people who are like-minded together so that you can grow in your beliefs with those people and also you have people that you relate to yeah community um, if you are if you're always around people who don't believe the same things that you believe you're gonna always feel alone or you're gonna you know have that kind of come to jesus moment like you have where you realize the things that you need out of a friendship you can't get from these people because they're too dissimilar yeah yeah that's real i mean you know i think about like what you said the you know they're not forsaking so assembling like coming together gathering together as a group of people um and it makes me think about like community um you know i i don't want to make this like a, a a slight at small groups and churches or anything like that um, I think small groups can be really helpful. And I think sometimes people really grow and, and gain really strong friendships in, in small groups. But I also think that small groups sometimes are like, can be weird pockets of kind of forced community. Like, I don't know. I think that there's a sense where like, even in churches, like you can date small groups rather than like, just, well, this is the group that's available for me. Like, I'm going to just stick in this one because like, sometimes like you don't, you don't fit in that space, right? Like you don't, you, you don't necessarily like, like these, these folks don't necessarily rock with the way that you think about the world. And like, there's tensions against like, against like the stuff that you need and, and need to rock through. And then, and those folks, like some of those folks, like you just don't need to, you don't need to be spending, you know, extensive amount of time just cause you feel like it's a, a standard of the church um because i think like community needs to be real like you know i've 
I really, I really feel like uh, for me, you know, I've, le- I've, I've, I've led multiple small groups throughout my, my life, um, throughout what I've done in, in school and churches that I've worked at and things like that. And in a lot of those time periods, um, you know, anytime I'd start talking about race or something like there'd be, there'd be people who'd leave the small group who wouldn't come back. And, you know, for me, I like that needs to be a test of like any time I'm rocking in a group like that, you know, because I don't need to be spending, I don't need to be spending my life like that in a space where I have to like, you know, yearn for solidarity or something like that. And like, wonder if this person is going to flip the moment that I expose anything that has to do with black people like that. I don't think that's, that's my work. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know, like it's, you know, this, at this stage of life, right. You know, I moved back home at the beginning of this year, you know, quit my job at the church I was working at and like moved to kind of focus, you know, on my art and then COVID hit. And so, you know, I've been inside forever and there's not, it's not like I'm, it's not like I've gained new friendships during this time. Like, you know, I've, I can grow in the relationships with my family, um, and then develop some of the relationships with the friends that I have, but I haven't gained new friends, but one, I have spent enough time, like understanding where different people sit, sit in my life and what to expect from certain people and to know where certain people's like places are and so that i'm like i'm fine like i'm not losing my mind i've got plenty of work to do i've been working on this project throughout the whole thing um and then i and i've got i've got friends in different spaces who hold different positions in my life and and i don't need everyone to be my best friend or my closest friend like you talked about in that, that time five years ago, like, I just need, I need, you know, certain people to, to fulfill their certain roles. And when certain people don't fulfill their roles, you know, or like when, when certain people be like tripping, like if somebody says something out of pocket or they're not, you know, they're, you know, in in any sense of a relationship, like you're, you're having a space of communication, like different people have different needs, like different people have, different desires and, and, and kind of different standards of of whatever that they're trying to hold people to. And for me, there's a sense that, um, I've, I've figured that out a lot more than I, than I did five years ago. And I'm, and I'm at a way healthier space, especially with moving around because, you know, there's not most of the people I went to high school with that I was close to, like, don't live here anymore. And so, you know, in the relative area, like one, we don't even, I don't even live in the same city that I lived in when I grew up. And then on top of that, it's like, um, most of my people aren't even here. And so, yeah, it's, it's that balance of knowing where, where different people sit. So, word up. Well, I think we'll, we'll wrap on that. I appreciate you, Krista and all the, the advice you give me over the years. Um, you know, all the advice you continue to give me and to take some time amidst uh, being a physician, an orthopedic surgeon amidst the COVID-19 crisis and continuing to rock through all that and then st- and still taking time on your vacation or to rock with me. Um, I, I don't know that I said this off top, so I want to say it right now. Krista is also a orthopedic surgery resident at uh, Howard University. I don't know if Howard people call Howard the Howard University, but Howard University. Okay, though they do that for like Hampton and stuff. Like you know, I'd be hearing that with like uh, what's his name, DJ Envy and stuff. But um, yeah, Howard University uh, orthopedic surgery resident. You know, a very male dominated field, and to be a woman and a black woman, like killing. Right white male dominated yeah so to be a black woman to be a woman and to be a black woman killing it in that space is something that deserves all the roses and so 
we celebrate you in this space and the Durac Thought space for that and all the, the freshness that that is. So yeah, um, I'm proud of you. I appreciate all your advice and thanks for taking time to rock with me. My pleasure. Cool.